Hi everyone! It is already October, which is crazy. Summer has flown by and we're already well into fall. And tonight we are bringing you the October horse racing hangout. I have one awesome guest who is going to be hanging out with us tonight, Kelsey Riley, uh, who is the international editor for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I'm going to be inviting her on shortly and telling you a bit more about her and her background in the thoroughbred industry. But to get started, if you are just stumbling upon this, you've never seen us before, we are Amplify Horse Racing. Amplify is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to promoting educational opportunities and jobs and careers in the thoroughbred industry, primarily to youth and young adults. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. You have stumbled upon our monthly horse racing hangout, which is basically our monthly virtual event to educate about careers in the thoroughbred industry, the huge variety of career and job opportunities that are out there, but to also teach you some of the fundamental skills that you need to get more involved in maybe pursuing some of those careers. So we really dive into some of that fundamental knowledge that's going to be really important as you take the next step in getting more involved in the industry. So thank you so much. This is tonight is part one of a two part series racing around the world. So the last two months, if you joined us and tuned in, we had part one and part two of racing around the US. So we talked about racing jurisdictions and breeding regions here in the US. The follow up episode to that was teaching you about a couple of educational opportunities uh, that are available in a couple different states. Tonight, we're talking about racing around the world. So giving you a broad overview of what thoroughbred racing looks like in several different countries and really, you know, striving to showcase that this is a super, super international industry and international sport. And a lot of those countries are very interconnected and the way they go about their business and racing. And I mean, Breeders' Cup World Championships is coming up, which we're going to be teaching you more about in the coming weeks. And then our part two of this series, which is going to happen in November. Uh, we always do these on the the third Tuesday of the month. So um, check us out in November for part two, and we're going to be showcasing some educational programs in other countries. So I always like to go through a couple of announcements before we dive into our episodes. A reminder that, you know, as we get into the end of this year, and we don't have as many live events to welcome you to. Uh, we will always still have these horse racing hangouts, and then we do two podcast episodes per month. So if you haven't checked out the Amplify Horse Racing podcast, you can get that on any of your podcasting platforms. And it's super similar to the hangouts in that we're interviewing people about their careers, how they built those careers, and then fundamental skills that are really important to know if you want to get more involved in such a career. So later on, uh, we are going to have Kim Weir from the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation join us for the last few minutes of the Hangout to tell us about something really exciting that is coming up on Thursday that you can actually tune into and would be a great learning experience. You know, we love to share those learning experiences. So without further ado, I'm going to read Miss Kelsey Riley's bio because as you know, I hope you all are taking notes. I know that a lot of you do. Hearing somebody's bio is a good way of, you know, starting to read their background and see the, you know, the wide array of opportunities uh, that they have taken advantage of that have led them to their current career. So Kelsey has been a reporter and editor with the Thoroughbred Daily News since 2012. In her current role as international editor, she works with a global team to pr produce TDN's international coverage of racing and sales. Her work regularly takes her to Europe, and she has also visited Australia, Japan, Argentina, and the Middle East. Kelsey has a degree in journalism and media studies and is a graduate of Godolphin Flying Start. In 2018, she harnessed her love of travel, horses, and adrenaline rushes and competed in the Mongol Derby, riding 620 miles aboard 29 different horses across the Mongolian steppe over seven and a half days. So she is definitely someone who is well qualified to be talking to us about racing across the world in a lot of different forms. So 
Kelsey, welcome to the Horse Racing Hangout. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. This is going to be a great episode tonight. I just wanted to get up our banner and remind everyone that wherever you are watching from right now, you can send us your questions or comments. If you're watching this feed live uh, and you have a question for Kelsey along the way, we love questions and please don't save them until the very end because we can't answer them in the last 30 seconds of the show when a lot of people end up sending them. So we always start this episode with, or each of our hangout episodes by asking, um, where are you from? And, and tell us your story of how you got involved in the thoroughbred industry. Um, so I'm from Ontario, Canada, uh, which in Canada is, uh, is kind of the horse racing hub there. And um, how I got my start in the industry. Uh, so I was just a horse lover as a kid. Um, you know, I don't have family background in the industry, but my, my family always had a couple horses on our property and I fell in love with, with horses and riding and just, you know, was at a stage where I was taking in anything that involved horses. Um, and so through that, I came across racing. And uh, at the time that I stumbled across racing. It was a few weeks out from the Kentucky Derby that year. I was maybe about 12 years old. And um, so I read everything about the contenders for, for the Derby. I'd never watched a race, but I, I got really into it. And then I sat down on that day and watched the race and just knew that this was what I wanted to do with my life. So, um, and then from there, um, I got a job, um, you know, working at a pre-training um, and layup facility for, for racehorses. And then from there, um, I, I moved up to working for one of uh, the leading breeders in Canada, um, a man named Gus Shikadans uh, at his farm. And I worked there through uh, my time in college. So while I was doing my, my journalism degree, I was able to spend the weekends and summers working on, on that farm and, you know, doing everything from foaling, um, you know, raising the foals, uh, getting, getting, you know, the mares through the season and everything, um, breaking, sale prep. It was a small farm of, you know, maybe uh, 20 mares max. Um, so we were able to really get exposed to every facet of the, of the horse's uh, life cycle, which was, which was a, a fantastic experience. Um, and then from there, I went on to do, um, you know, a couple internships in Kentucky, and then from there went on to do uh, the Godolphin Flying Start. So taking a step back, you mentioned having studied journalism. So where was it in and amongst all of your internships that you decided you wanted to pursue journalism as your career path? Yeah, so so funny enough, um, you know, through most of the time that I was doing my degree, it wasn't actually my intention to pursue journalism full time. I always loved writing. Um, it was something I enjoyed. And I thought, you know, I'll, I'll do a degree in journalism and media studies. And it's something where, you know, what my plan was to actually pursue. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, working with the broodmares and, and the stud farm, um, you know, situation. And so my plan was to do that. And I thought, you know, I can write articles on the side. Uh, it's something, you know, I can have as a backup plan sort of deal. Um, and then in my last semester of college, uh, I had to, to go out and do an eight week internship. And so I came to Kentucky and did my internship with the Blood Horse magazine. Um, and that eight weeks, I think quickly stretched to about 12 weeks or so, 12 weeks plus. I just, I didn't want to go home. Um, but it was really, that was my first real exposure to writing about horse racing, you know, the two things that I loved. And I was, I was just knew that that was what I wanted to do um, with my career. So earlier, you know, as we go along, I always try to explain some of these industry words that we might throw out that somebody might not know. Uh, explain to us what pre-training is. You mentioned that was one of your oh, first internships. Yeah, yeah. So so pre-training is, and it's also called breaking or breaking in, is when um, you have the, for, for thoroughbred racehorses, this will be done as yearlings. Um, so in their in their, you know, um, first year of life or just after they've they've turned one year old, actually. Um, and that's just the process of um, getting them uh, trained under tack. So saddle and bridle. So that's teaching them how to wear the saddle, how to wear the bridle, how to behave with the rider on their back. Um, you know, the the understanding um, what the rider is asking with their legs, with their hands. So that's just 
the the very first stages of training the racehorse. I like the word pre-training a lot more than breaking. I'm glad that you <laughs> use that. I feel like breaking is almost a very American term, whereas a lot of other yes. countries you hear pre-training. So I think when I heard pre-training for the first time, I was kind of like, huh? But then here we're like breaking. We're going to go break them in. But yeah. No, we promise, guys, there's no breaking involved. No, no, so. exactly. It's it's the, it's the same process. It's just the, the different terminologies used across uh, American and um, so exactly, breaking is more the, the term in America. Pre-training is the European slash Australian <laughs> terminology. Let's see, a great tie-in for racing around the world tonight. We can start <laughs> introducing them to all this different vocab as well. There's, yeah, when you go international, there's so much. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so Godolph and Flying Start, we're both graduates of, of the Godolph and Flying Start program. People who have tuned into this show before have, have heard of it, but explain to us what Godolph and Flying Start is and when somebody introduced you to that and why did you decide to pursue the Flying Start program? Yeah, so the Godolph and Flying Start is a two-year management training course. Um, it's sponsored by Sheikh Mohammed, who's the ruler of Dubai and one of the, um, the, the biggest, most successful breeders of racehorses all over the world. Um, so he decided, um, it's over 20 years ago now, to start this program because he, he um, you know, didn't see where formal training was coming from for the, for the future leaders of the industry. And because he loves the industry so much, he wanted to, to you know, forward the industry. And this was his way of, you know, producing people who were well-educated and, and in a, a good position to, to move the industry forward. So, um yeah, so the program is two years, and uh, it's based out of uh, Sheikh Mohammed's Kildangan Stud in Ireland, but you actually travel to five different countries um, and are based out of, out of his um, facilities over those two years, and you just really learn everything to do with um, anything you can imagine concerning the racing industry. So um, from hands-on work with the horses, and we did do some pre-training of horses there. So, <laughs> so there was that. And um, yeah, hands-on work with the horses. Um, you know, you do v uh, veterinary modules, uh, nutrition modules. Um, you know, you, you spend time at the major sales, shadowing people. Uh, you get externship opportunities. So you get to go outside Godolphin and, and you know, for four to six weeks at a time learn under under other people um, and then you also go as far as doing um, business modules and leadership modules um, so it's really it, to prepare well-rounded people in the industry um, but you know well-rounded you know leaders in, in general as well I think that was the best description I've ever heard of good old from flying start in under five minutes that was really very detailed and like you told everybody everything they needed to know so well it's anybody... hard to yeah it's hard to cram two years of explanation into into yeah. less than five minutes but it's it's just really if you if you have a passion for for racing and and the great thing about it too is that there's no um, specific requirements for the people that they take on to it. The, the, the trainees that they select are generally between about 22 to, you know, 28, 29 years old. That's general, but there's no requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so they're really just looking for people that have the passion and the want to learn. Um, so it, it's really, it's, it's open to everybody. It's equal opportunity. It's funded by Sheikh Mohammed. So, you know, you're not, you don't have to worry about the financial aspect of it either. Yeah. And so as we kind of go on with this episode, anybody out there who might be thinking, you know, whoa, that that's amazing. That sounds like it's really for me, but, you know, they only accept 12 people per year. You know, there are so many other opportunities out there for you to travel in the thoroughbred industry beyond Flying Start. So even though that was a big part of both of mine and, and Kelsey's young careers and our learning experiences as we got involved in the industry, you know, don't feel like, you know, if maybe something like that, a program that's kind of, you know, has all of those academic components to it is maybe not for you. We can tell you about all sorts of other opportunities to travel to other countries and still work in the thoroughbred industry. But 
But going back to Flying Start, Kelsey, I remember exactly like somebody had sent me an article on it on Facebook, maybe a couple weeks after I signed up for Facebook for the <laughs> first time when I was like 13 years old. And I thought, I'm going to do that someday. So what was, who introduced you to it and what motivated you to want to pursue that avenue? Yeah. So I was maybe um, 16 years old, I'm going to guess. And um, I had uh, in, I think it was in my stocking at Christmas, I got this magazine. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Canadian Thoroughbred, which is like the, the trade publication um, for racing in Canada. And so I had that there and I was flipping through it. And there was a little snippet on um, a, a young woman called Carolyn Costigan, who is Canadian and was in one of the, the very first Flying Start classes. And um, it was a picture of, there was a picture of her uh, in Dubai um, with, uh, I believe it was Dubawi when he was in training and um, talking about how she had this course that she was on. Wow. And I just thought, Oh, I thought, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. So I immediately, I still, like you said, I still remember this so well. I went on, got onto the computer and went to, at the time it was darlyflyingstart.com and pulled it up <laughs> and just, and just knew I, I have to do this. I'm going to do this. And like I said, I was about 16 at the time. I finished high school, went through college, did my whole thing, but literally everything that I did was aimed towards someday applying to the, the flying yes. start wow and, I totally as a, like that. <laughs> and and every year when the I, I was waiting for the new trainees to come up on the website and i would read all their bios yes and, and, wow yeah. i was like stalking every <laughs> single one yeah I, <laughs> and so you know try to get ideas of you know different work experiences i could do to to get on the course so and then i applied um as i was finishing my my last year of college so yeah. <laughs> wow. That is so cool. And so, so funny. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Like I remember going to basically all of my college advisors and was like, this is what I'm working towards. All of my <laughs> schoolwork and all extracurriculars will be devoted to this. So yeah, they're like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, okay, yeah. you have one of the strangest goals compared to all these other students, but it yeah. worked out just fine for both of us. So yeah. <laughs> what did you do coming off of Flying Start after you graduated? Um, did you go directly to work for the Thoroughbred Daily News? I did. Yeah. So wow. I talked about those those externships that you do um, during the course. And um, my the one that I did in um, America was with the TDN. So oh. uh, so I went to them and spent uh, six weeks with them in New Jersey. And, uh, you know, I was I, and I obviously enjoyed it very much. And, um, you know, when after I left or when I was leaving, they said, you know, get, get in contact with us when you're closer to finishing, finishing the course. And that's what I did. And they, uh, they had an opportunity at that time. So I, um, I left Ireland at the end of the course and headed straight to New Jersey. And um, I've been, I've been with TDN for, yeah, it's just over nine years now. Wow. So yeah, so <laughs> it's been, it's been quite good. So how did you, what position did you start with versus working, you know, I should say, what position did you start with? And then how did you work your way up to international editor where you're at now? Yeah, so I started out as um, an assistant editor. So, um, you know, I was doing little stories, um, little press releases, uh, race results, um, you know, formatting the paper and, and, and pulling photos and putting everything together. And um you know, I was, uh, it was really a, a right place at the right time sort of situation in a way to, you know, of, of course I worked hard, um, you know, from, from the time I got there, but I was also very fortunate that at the time that I arrived there, the TDN was really wanting to increase their international coverage. Um, it was at that time, it was still very heavily American with just a tiny, you know, little international report on the oh, end. Wow. And they, mm -hmm, and they were very, they're very keen, but they hadn't really taken big steps yet to, to increase the international. And, um, and I said, well, you know, I've just come back from this two year course where I traveled the world. Like I know a lot about international racing and I, and I have many contacts um, internationally. So they, uh, so they were, you know, kind of keen to unleash me, on that. Um, so that's really how, how that evolved. And uh, it was about um, a year and a half after I started um, 
before I moved into my position that I'm currently in. Um, and, and our international coverage has just continued to evolve. Um, it, it's about six years ago now, I think five, five or six years ago that we started an, an actually separate European and international publication. Um, and, you know, we just keep gaining traction with that. So it's, so it's exciting to see, um, you know, how that's all gone from, from start to where it is now. And that, you know, before we really dive into a day in the life of your job right now, I want to add uh, that, you know, for someone who's just getting started, I think that's a really great example of saying, hey, I have this unique skill set, or I think I can really excel in this area, and I bring these skills to the table. This is how I can help to improve what we're currently producing. And that can apply to, you know, any job in the industry that someone out there listening might be interested in. And I encourage anybody to, you know, identify what are your skill sets, what makes you unique, uh, you know, how, how can that unique piece add value to the company that you're currently working in or some internship that you're in. You know, a lot of people continue on from internships to work full time for those companies. So just a little uh, that can be our, our tip of the day, I guess. Mm -hmm. But what what is a day in your life like, Kelsey? I'm sure that it changes mm -hmm. a lot. I know you just got back from a couple big industry events, which I'd love for you to talk about. But what is kind of a typical day like for you? Yeah, well, you're exactly right. It's uh, there's hardly a, a typical day. Um, you know, it, it, every day is a little different, which is um, it, which is important to me. I like uh, I like to mix things up and uh, be a little bit surprised every day. <laughs> yeah. And uh, some days we get bigger surprises than others, but yep. um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, generally, you know, I would get up. So I'm the the bulk of our international coverage is for Europe. So I'm semi working on uh, European time. Um, so I would get up uh, maybe six, six thirty in the morning. And um, the first thing I do is check my email, we would get a lot of um, press releases, um, and, and, you know, about news that's happening uh, going on there. So I'll go through that, see what's been sent um, overnight, see what needs to be dealt with immediately, what's breaking news, uh, you know, what I can leave and, and work on throughout the day. And then um, the, the whole day is just sort of a, a piecing together the, the paper. We're a daily paper. So we start fresh every single day with this blank template. So I'm, like I said, starting out with my, um, with my news, my smaller news pieces. Um, you know, I'm always sort of working on some sort of longer form feature in the background of things, um, you know, when I have a few minutes here and there. Um, and then at the same time, I'm managing a team of, of other writers who are also working on their own projects. And um, then throughout the day, I will be getting in the, the race results from my from my team members that that um, work on producing the race results. So they'll be watching the racing and, um, you know, any any good, um, you know, standout winners, they'll be writing like little reports on the race and their pedigree. So then they'll send those to me and I will fit them all into the paper. Um, and if there's any sales going on, um, either I will be covering it in person or one of my team members will be. So they will send me their copy at the end of the day. I will read through it and just, you know, um, you know, check for any uh, like anything that needs might need to be fixed. And um, then kind of the, the very last thing at the end of the day is uh, what we call formatting the paper. So we'll just be laying everything out with um, with our photos and with our advertisements. And uh, so my my typical day uh, would probably my, my typical day in the office would probably wrap up around four o'clock. But of course, if a sale or something is, is going on, then then we're going a little bit later waiting for that. Do you check the emails pre or post morning coffee? Uh, pre. Yeah, that's kind of. Wow. Well, that's well when I when I. When the alarm goes off and I give the email a little check, and if there's nothing urgent, I, I might snooze for another 10 minutes. So, gotcha. gotcha. Well, that's, I can't do morning so. emails until after uh, coffee has, has been consumed. So, so don't that's, worry, the coffee is straight after, it's straight after the first check. Yeah. It's a lot of 
multitasking to do. Like it seems mm-hmm. like, you know, being having that ability to multitask and focus on a lot of different projects at once is kind of a key part of what you're doing, right? Like what oh, would yeah. be some of the key skills that you need to be able to juggle a day like that? Um yeah. Uh, organization, I, I think, as as you just pointed out, is um, is pretty paramount, um, and also uh, probably uh, what's it like? Just being able to to um, give tasks off to other people, um, you know, know your team members and their strengths, and and you know, uh, di- put the work out accordingly, and and you know, use your team to to accomplish everything that needs to be done in the day, because um, some days it, it can be become quite a bit. So, and, um, and I think uh, the ability, the ability to multitask, um, because like I said, you can be, I could be working on something and then suddenly something else pops in that's important that we have to get out, um, you know, in our email blasts and on our social media stream. So I, I've got to put that aside, work on this, and then something else might come up So I've got to, you know, it might be something else before I get back to the original project and then someone's emailing me. So it's, uh, there's a lot of multitasking involved in it uh, as well. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) But then there, there are a lot of perks too, because as you know, at least recently you've been able to do some pretty amazing travel for your job. So in a typical year, we're just going to skip over COVID um, 2020. But in a regular year, how much traveling would you be doing abroad? Um, and then we're going to talk about your recent trip and what went into that. Yeah. So in a regular year, I might um, go to England maybe twice, um, France two or three times. Um, and that's those trips are for the yearling and breeding stock sales, which are uh, largely concentrated in the fall. So the fall becomes uh, very busy with <laughs> with travel. Um, and then I usually get, um, you know, one or two different trips thrown in there too. I've been three times to Japan um, for wow. their for their yearling sale, which is in July. And then also I've been to the Japan Cup, which is their, their big race um, in November. Um, and a few years ago, I got to go to Argentina um, in March for their um, for their big yearling sale, um, and that was that was a fantastic trip as well. I got to learn a ton about the South American industry, um, and I've been to I've, I've been to the Middle East a few times. I've been to um, Dubai and to Qatar, um, wow. and um, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm leaving something out. Um, but yeah, so so anyway, there's those there's sort of those, uh, you know, trips that are annually more more so in the fall, and then I get opportunities um, to to go around to a few different places in the first part of the year. And so you've had a busy fall this year. Things are kind of starting to get back to normal. So what prompted you to travel to Ireland and the UK? What is going on right now, sales wise overseas? And, um, you know, how do you manage when you're gone for that long? Yeah, so the uh, so the main yearling sales uh, in Europe are happening at the moment. So it, it really started in um, in August with uh, in France with their big yearling sale at a sale company called Arcana and then um, moved on to to Ireland at the end of September with the, the Goffs Orby sale. And then um, early October, moved to uh, Tattersalls, which is the big sale company in the UK. And um, yeah, so I uh, actually didn't go to Ireland, but I went to uh, to the UK to Tattersalls. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So I went for um, for almost two weeks, and uh, and uh, went to yeah, it was I think like six sessions of of sales there. Um, you know, went to some of the the farms to see some stallions um, that I hadn't gotten to see having been away uh, last year because of, of COVID. But, um, you know, for for our publication for the TDN, we we put a lot of emphasis on our sales coverage in doing very detailed, robust uh, sale coverage because the yearling sales really um, dictate, they can sort of tell you what the health of the industry is. You can see where people are wanting to spend their money, um, which 
stallions um, or pedigrees or whatever are proving popular, it gives you it gives um, breeders the opportunity to assess the market ahead of making their their mating plans decisions for the following year. Um, so we put a lot of emphasis on our sales coverage. Like you'll see some other publications are, are more, much more heavily towards their racing and race results. And, and we do cover that in depth, but we put kind of an extra push behind our sales coverage. So I was over there um, working with our international, I'm sorry, our European editor, um, Emma Berry. And for the big sales, uh, she and I will be over there and we uh, we'll basically sit all day in the the sales ring and and watch the results and see what's happening and um, you know pinpoint people to to interview. So then we'll we'll head out and um, and you know track down those people on the grounds and interview them and um, and yeah, just uh, report on like I said what what the trends are. Um, if there's you know we particularly like to report on if there are um, any new people um, coming in and. Uh, and investing in horses. That's something that's always that people want to know about when there's new players coming into the industry. Um, you know, what stallions are, are popular, especially among the younger stallions, um, how people are perceiving the first crops of the younger stallions that are coming through. Um, yeah, so really, we were just out there um, assessing what's happening in the market and putting together a report for our readers. Those are really good. You did a great job of being so specific about like what you guys are targeting. And I think that's good for, you know, somebody as they're maybe reading the TDN and taking in some of that information and, you know, cause it can be a lot to, you know, especially as you're just starting to learn the industry, it's so much mm -hmm. to take it all in. And that's a great point that the sales are, you know, really you can kind of put a finger on the pulse of the industry to feel uh, how how the market is doing overall from sales to racing and how it resonates all the way through. And so mm -hmm. actually something that I found really helpful as I was learning was reading the TDN consistently, you know, even if I didn't understand it all, uh, even looking through pictures and seeing pictures of people's faces, as funny as it mm -hmm. sounds, really, really helps to start connecting the dots and be like, oh, okay, I saw them there or they bought that one horse from so and so and then mm -hmm. as you start going to these events in person you know it just helps to make it all you know a little bit more relevant and yeah. like, connect the dots in your brain so that was a, and, a great description yeah and and i'm obviously biased because i i work for the tdn but i was gonna say exactly what you said like it's it would be it will be overwhelming at first especially when you consider like um, the coverage, the robust coverage that we have of American and international, um, it's a lot to take in. And it's, it's even a lot to take in when you, when you're advanced in your career and, and, and more experienced, but, you know, at this, at the start of your career, just, just read it every day. And like you said, not, not all of it or not a lot of it will make uh, tons of sense at first, but you'll start to recognize things. And, and like you said, when you get out there, you know, everything will make a bit more sense. So before we kind of segue into the next episode or the next episode, the next segment where we're going to talk about, you know, get into some of the specifics about each individual country and their, you know, some things that make them unique. Last episode, fans out there, you guys voted for what you want as your monthly thing. So I asked whether you wanted a monthly fact, a monthly article or monthly homework and you guys asked for homework which is great good on you like work <laughs> ethic is valuable <laughs> yep exactly so i have your homework of the month courtesy of kelsey she's helped me out with this one so your homework of the month is going to be to research three race tracks in each of the following countries ireland the uk france and australia and I'm going to know whether you did your homework or not because you're going to email me that. So our email is info at amplifyhorseracing.org. That's pretty easy to remember. Again, info at amplifyhorseracing.org. Again, homework of the month, 
three racetracks. Email them to me. I want them from Ireland, the UK, France, and Australia. So there you guys have it. And there might just be a prize involved. I think I'm going to do a drawing amongst everybody who uh, sends me their answers. And that will be announced on the next episode. So there's a little added motivation there, guys. Do your homework and Mm -hmm. you will be put in a drawing for a prize that we will announce for the next episode. Mm -hmm. So, Kelsey, you've been to a lot of different countries with racing. So I want to narrow it down to some of the bigger ones and have you pinpoint something that, you know, I guess some fun facts or something that makes each of those countries unique. So starting with um, breeding and racing in Ireland, and I'm just going to kind of lump those together, breeding, racing, sales. What makes Ireland unique when it comes to their thoroughbred industry? Hmm. Well, Ireland is just like really all in on, on the horse. Like it's such a, it's such a culture there. And, um, you see like, so it's very much a a national sport and, um, and so many people follow it and, and get very into it. And, um, and Irish breads are just known for being, um, you know, very just good, uh, tough horses that, um, that can, that get exported in and compete in in the biggest races all over the world. Um, so they have they have a fantastic reputation um, as you know the horse the, the horses have that reputation and also the the people you see you know I feel like you go um, certainly here to, to Lexington Kentucky but also to any of the the major uh, you know racing centers around the world and and you'll find droves of Irish people <laughs> and uh yes. and they're just yes. they're just you know they and it shows their just the love of of horses and racing that's in, ingrained into their culture and then also just their the level of of horsemanship um that they have there. Have you read the book Horse Trader? Yes. Horse Trader I wish they would have read it before Flying Star because I think <laughs> it would have it just fully captures that love for the horse in Mm -hmm. Ireland and the deep, deep history of racing and breeding there and like the depth of their pedigrees and, you know, really explains why you see Irish horsemen and women in all of these different racing countries. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, Another recommendation, read horse trader. How about the UK? What is their unique feature? The UK is um, probably in terms of um, in terms of racing, uh, like the, the racing itself just has this this history. Um, they're they're really they're really well known um, for races like the the Derby, the the Epsom Derby, which is the original Derby that all other derbies are named after. <laughs> we we would call it Derby here. It's it's Derby over there. Um, so it's this very, it's this very, um, uh, you know, s- steep history of racing. Um, and, um, I would say as well, f- uh, for both, for both England and Ireland, um, uh, together, the, uh, a, a lot of the, um, the, the racing there is, is focused or has historically been more focused around, um, the, the slightly longer distance races and and on the turf so on the grass so all all top level racing in england and ireland takes place on the grass um there is there are circuits of of all weather racing um so like synthetic track racing but they wouldn't be they wouldn't be you know considered as good uh the the turf racing is where all the elite racing is and and they have historically put an emphasis on the um slightly longer races so a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half plus um, there is a bit of a changing trend recently where they are starting to focus on on slightly more speed oriented, but that's you know they still have that um, that sort of history to them. Australia, I'll give you a chance to, to <laughs> get your breath. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, Australia is is sort of the opposite. Um, speed is king in Australia, and they've they've just developed this reputation for that um, amongst all the racing nations. Um, you know, people are are breeding for speed. Speed is what sells at the sales. Um, 
you know, uh, with the exception of, of the Melbourne Cup, all of their big races um, and their their most well known races are for for sprinters. Um, and then also in Australia, it's um, it's also just the the public, um, just the way the public gets behind racing. It's so it's such a popular sport there, and it's such a growing sport there. And um, Australia was really the country that launched uh, syndication, which you see uh, all over the world now as, as a growing thing. But it, what that means is that um, people can buy tiny pieces of horses. So it makes it affordable for you know your everyday person to own a, a piece of a racehorse. And you go to Australia and the, the cliche that you'll hear people say about Australia is that, oh, you get to Australia and your taxi driver owns a, owns a piece of a racehorse, but it's true. But it's true. <laughs> it's true. Like you'll, you'll get into taxi from the airport and they'll ask what you're there for horse racing. And they'll, Oh, they'll tell you about their horse. It's um, it's like, I think the most recent stat I heard was like one in 300 Australians owns a racehorse or something. It's, it's just oh, cool. so popular. Um, so yeah, Australia is a really, really interesting and fun place for racing. Australia was really the the country that truly captured me along the way um, throughout Flying Start. And I wanted to add too that their foaling practices are a bit different than what we'd experience in, in a lot of the other countries. You know, here in the US and most other countries, mares would foal or have their babies in a stall. Whereas in Australia, in general, they are outside either in a in a paddock or in a small pasture and then one of the coolest things that I remember was you know several of the farms round up mares and foals on four wheelers when they have to bring them in or they call them quad bikes and to me that was just one of the most surreal experiences like being on this quad bike slash four wheeler driving over these hills and the mares and foals galloping in and then ponying them alongside this quad bike. So it is just so cool. So mm -hmm. there's my, I also, just, I also just remember doing that and being like, I really hope I don't run over a super poisonous snake. I know. <laughs> I'm out here. It's a little I really terrifying. Hope I don't get bit by something that's going to kill me today. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah. I can, I've lived without that fear. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Thankfully, I didn't. I didn't see a single snake when I was there, which is yeah. pretty crazy. But yeah. Yeah. Australia I'm, has gone yeah. all the most poisonous things. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing that makes them unique. Um, France. Yeah. What makes France unique? France. Um, France is uh, France is a is a racing industry that's uh, actually let me take it back to the breeding industry. France is a breeding industry that's really made big strides um, uh, the last few years, the last decade, decade and a half or so. Um, they've really put a, a big investment into both their their stallions and their their brood mares. And whereas I would say they probably in kind of the the times before that took a bit of a backseat to um, England and Ireland. They're, they're very much on par now. They're, they're producing a very top stock and, um, you know, and their, their yearlings are selling for the top prices at the yearling sales. Um, and, and also people are, people are very, people in Europe are very um, attracted to racing in, uh, in France because um, they, they have good prize money there relative to um, some other places in Europe. Um, and, uh, and they have, let's face it, they have beautiful facilities as well at um, Chantilly outside of, of Paris in, in Deauville, they have some some wonderful venues. So you know, on, on top of um, on top of just the, the good prize money, which is which drives uh, racing everywhere. Uh, I think people just enjoy being part of, of racing in France. So it's one of my every now and then when you know I'm daydreaming it's like oh I wish that you know you know when you got just those daydream jobs of I wish I was doing something else right now love my job but every <laughs> now and then I'm like oh I wish I could just go off and be an exercise rider and ride out in Shanti every day it's beautiful and, yeah and just eat croissants and drink <laughs> espresso and you know go get on racehorses every day in Shanti yeah so yeah. Pretty cool place. Yeah. And then our last one that I'm going to leave it with, even though we could go over so many different countries, what makes Dubai unique? Oh, Dubai. Um, 
Well, I mean, probably what makes it uh, unique is the fact that, you know, I talked a bit about the the breeding industries there as well. And Dubai, Dubai really doesn't have that. I think it was tried briefly maybe to, to breed some thoroughbreds in Dubai. Um, and there was a, one or two grade one winners that, that came out of that. But really, it's it, it's just it's just the racing industry. And it's centered around uh, one racetrack, which is uh, made on race course. And th there are other tracks there. Are, there's plenty of other tracks, um, you know, in the UAE, but that's where all the, the big international racing is mm -hmm. held at Maidan. And um, it's also just a very international um, event. People, the, the, the main carnival is three months long and, and trainers from, uh, from Europe, America, South America, South Africa are bringing their horses uh, to run throughout that three month uh, festival because uh, the purses purses are very good. It's the middle of of the northern hemisphere winter where there's not um, you know a lot of big racing and not a lot of opportunities in some other countries. So like um, in in Europe, racing really slows down um, for for the winter. There's some smaller circuits that that still race, but in terms of you know, big international racing, it really shuts down um, for about four months. So a lot of European trainers like to take their horses and and race them in, in Dubai and have some opportunities out there. And I mean, it's, uh, you know, when we're talking Maidan and yeah, you touched on a good thing, Kelsey, that Dubai is part of United Arab Emirates, which is the country, but just focusing on Dubai, like it's a racetrack in a desert. It is. is so... <laughs> mind-blowing and so mm -hmm. amazing and i think a, you know a good thing that's maybe worth noting that with having or not having a breeding industry there a lot of the countries that have very thriving breeding industries you know it's really focused on the land that you're raising those horses on as well so in lexington they uh it's often spoken about the limestone in the soil and the calcium content and how that helps to develop really good bones and horses. And then you think about trying to develop a horse, you know, living and thriving in, in the desert, like it would be a much different type of environment to be raising that horse in. So mm -hmm. land is another huge part of raising horses. So mm -hmm. I see that we have our, our other guests here who will be joining us momentarily, but before we throw it over to Kim, I have one more question for you, Kelsey, and I want you to stay on with us too while Kim yes. is on, because then I'll have a final, final question to ask okay. the two of you. <laughs> what would you recommend to a young person who might be listening to this and wants to start traveling and working in another country and racing? How should they start learning about racing and breeding around the world? What is a good starting point? Um, like I said, like I kind of touched on earlier, for me, um, getting into, uh, I, I guess you could look at it multiple ways. I, I really enjoyed getting into a smaller farm. Like I mentioned, the farm that I started out on, it was, you know, about 20 broodmares, um, you know, which is relatively small, but you got to do everything. Um, and you got to, you know, experience all different, all different facets. So it was a very quick, um, you know, very quality learning experience. Um, it, and, and it was great for me. And then I uh, later moved on to some, some bigger farms, but at the same time, um, you know, and talking about um, getting an international experience and um, getting in with um, some of these farms, like a, a Darley or a Coolmore, you can get opportunities to through that to travel to their uh, facilities in, in other parts of the world. And that's, you know, fantastic experience. And that's, I think, something that's really great about the racing industry is that the opportunities to travel are very readily available. So if that's something that you want to do and are passionate about, then it's something that that you'll likely be able to achieve because it's just such an international industry. Like, it's, it's amazing. You go, you travel to sales worldwide and see a lot of the same people. And, um, you know, you, you, with, um, a completely different avenue we can go down with with um you know the prominence of shuttle stallions you see starting to see the same pedigrees everywhere so it's just a very international industry um so yeah you could you could get in with one of those larger um operations and then have lots of opportunity to travel 
That's awesome. That is really good advice, Kelsey. Thank you so much. You have been amazing. Stick with us for a couple more minutes. Yep. Uh, guys, there is a very cool event that is going to be happening on Thursday that I hope you all tune into. Last year, I don't know if you remember, but we did a little virtual watch party for the um, TRF, Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, Blackburn Horse Show, and you got to learn more about uh, the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation Second Chances Program. And they have a horse show at another facility this year, which you guys are going to get a chance to tune into and learn more about on Thursday. So without further ado, I would like to welcome this Kim Weir to tell us more about that. Hey, Kim. Hello, Ms. Anise. And hey, Kelsey. Hi. It is great to be with you both and the whole, the whole Amplify gang tonight. And it's also worth adding that uh, Kelsey and I were also out at Blackburn together this morning. I got to see the facility for my very first Yay. time, and um, it was incredible. It was really cool. Wow. So tell us about Lowell and what's going to be taking place on Thursday and why people should tune in. Well, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you both for having me, but thank you both for spending the time this morning for Kelsey for being our um, ambassador extraordinaire. Um, um, I just love knowing that you were both there today because we do talking about it. As, and the truth is exactly what you had experienced this morning, Anise, is why we're doing the horse show on Thursday is that giving people the opportunity to experience firsthand the horses working with these individuals who are incarcerated is is something we can talk about endlessly and I love to talk about it but there's just nothing like seeing it and it's what Kelsey has she's been there so many times and now you've been there but since many many people won't ever join us for a VIP visit day just the logistics of that are challenging um we have created this this uh, horse show unlike any other and in fact it was Kelsey our very dear beloved Kelsey that brought this idea to fruition for us last year as our producer executive director and cinematographer for the TRF Blackburn horse show she did it all and it was awesome and she taught us together we learned how to how to film a horse show in a prison and that's what we've it's a unique skill set that we have uh, developed and it's what we're putting to work on Thursday. Um, so quite simply, because you all know, you, you know, the live stream better than anyone, this Amplify Hangout group, you, you've got you've got it down. You click a link, you hear cool people talk about cool stuff. And that's what's going to happen on Thursday. Um, it will be um, some live live conversation. Uh, we're co-hosting the event with our very dear partners at the Florida Thoroughbred Breeders and Owners Association, the CEO of the FTBOA will be our my co-host, uh, Lonnie Powell. Uh, tremendous history between the TRF and FTBOA with regard to the program in Ocala, which is where, where this program is located, Ocala, Florida, a very horsey town, much like Lexington. And um, so we will do that. We will then take the audience inside the prison, as it were, to see the horses um, my tagline for this one is to see it, hear it, and feel it. And that is because these women, Kelsey will, will find this so entertaining because you did such a great job with the guys at Blackburn last year, but loquacious, they were not. Uh, the women <laughs> are much more expressive and uh, oh. <laughs> just, just, you know, I'm not trying to generalize here, but let's just accept the fact that these women pour their hearts out. Um, so it's really a gift that we get to share that um, together on Thursday and then we'll wrap up with some more conversation, much like this this conversation. We have some great folks joining us, um, kind of for the the after the after discussion, and it includes our fabulous Hall of Fame trainer Mark Cassie will be joining us, who's a multi generational Ocala boy, as he describes himself. Um, I would never describe him to that, but he says that, um, and then uh, <laughs> extraordinary in, in, in industry leader is what he is, um, as well as another great, great industry leader in Ocala, Niall Brennan, um, who has, in fact, hired several of the women who've come out of the Ocala program, and um, will speak about that experience. So we're just super excited. Um, we're super grateful to Kelsey for having blazed this trail with us last year and given us this extraordinary tool in our toolbox, and now... Um, We'll do it again. We're trying to taking this as version 2.0, uh, different program, same magic. Um, and the fact that everyone around the world can 
click a button, tune in and experience it is just a real gift. So that's what we'll be doing. Do it at eight o'clock on Thursday. That's eight o'clock Eastern time, knowing that Anise has a, a global following for Amplify. Um, we very much encourage folks to comment while you're watching because it's very fun to know where everybody is during the event, you know, where you're watching from or what your connection is. Um, and then like any good live stream, it will be available immediately after completion to be watched on demand by those who can't join us at eight o'clock on Thursday. But it's almost here. Kelsey remembers what this is like 48 hours before. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm still <laughs> doing email, <laughs> um, but it's going to be awesome. So thank you for letting me talk about it. I, I'm so excited and I'm so grateful. Anise, to, for you and all the support you give us, you're the best promotional partner ever. And Kelsey, because this is a tribute to you, my friend, that we're getting to do it again um, and learn from all that we did together. Yeah. It's, it's going to be so cool and you guys can watch it. It's going to be live on our Facebook. It's going to be streaming. So it will appear to you if you follow Amplify. And um, even if you don't follow Amplify, you should after tonight. And you should yes. follow the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation and the TDN, all of these things. <laughs> and it's going to be so cool. I am just so thrilled. You know, we talked about it this morning when we were at Blackburn, but you know, the, the healing power of horses in so many ways. And, uh, you know, with, with Amplify, we always love talking about how people came to, to learn about horses, be connected to horses, start working in the industry, any and all of those things that apply to them and, you know, whatever background they come from. So it's going to be amazing. And Kim, thank you so much for always being such a, such a great cheerleader. So I can't watch. I might try to make it to the watch party that's here in Lexington. Oh, good. I would love that. I'd love for both of you to be there. Um, our friend Pete Fornital is hosting. He's really good at hosting a party. So if you're in Lexington, um, <laughs> turn up at Mirror Twin. And that's true for all of your watchers. We also have one here in Saratoga, if anyone happens to be up this way. Um, and then there's actually one right in Louisville next to our new farm. So we, we, we encourage herds to gather to watch yeah. the show. <laughs> Sort of Lots like of great them. watch parties. <laughs> that is going to be so cool. So anyone who wants to meet me, I'll probably be at the watch party in Lexington. Yay! But <laughs> for, uh, for kind of our, our closing thing of the night, I would love for both of you to answer what is always our final question. What is your best mm. piece of advice for an industry newcomer? Kelsey, mm. I'll have you kick us off with that. Yeah. Um, I think just it, it, might sound pretty basic, but just work hard and show your passion. Um, like, I think uh, I just uh, feel so blessed all the time. Like I just, my entry into this was just so many fantastic people that were willing to help me um, and willing to, to open doors for me and give me opportunities. But I think that only comes if you are willing to, you know, put 110% effort into it and show that, you know, you have a passion for it and, and you're in this for the long term. So just work as, as hard as you possibly can, honestly. Yes. Yes. So true. I love that. No, I, I love that answer. It also still leaves me the chance to answer my answer, which goes dovetails, but isn't the same. I'm not going to do one of those. I just what she said, but I totally agree because I will, I'll echo it and say that the, the, the showing who you are, you know, that hard work, that passion, those things count for everything. But I will add to, to really be, um, be unafraid of, of asking, um, just be unafraid of asking. And, and then what do you ask? Well, and honestly, I've always said that if you ask people to tell you what they think about something, they will tell you. <laughs> um, everyone has, you know, all of us have life experiences and, 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 the curiosity, the, the, but there's a little bit of boldness. There's a little bit of courage um, that is required. And I would encourage that courage um, because once you ask the question, this industry, it, it is so giving and it is so excited about new people and passionate people that, you know, but you do have to sometimes walk up to that person that you've seen on TV a million times and say, hi, my name is Kim and I'd like to meet you. And, you know, they may look at you twice, like, but if you say, mm -hmm. I'd love you to hear what you think about this or, you know, just really listen. So, but be, don't be afraid to ask. That's my, that's my piece of advice. Cause the, the, my experiences like Kelsey's have been overwhelmed by how giving and, and, and supportive people have been, but, but you still have to, like somebody has to take the first move. And when you're new, it's you, you're mm -hmm. the person. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That's wow. a good point. People love that. curiosity. So <laughs> yeah. 
stay curious. Don't be afraid to ask things. Work hard and, and you'll be just fine. So mm -hmm. that is and, amazing. Uh, yeah, and I think you all are, are very lucky to have resources like Amplify and, and Denise um, that is just going to yeah, exactly. And so this this didn't exist when I was coming. I would have absolutely loved this. <laughs> uh, we're, we're always a work in progress. We always strive to grow. So anyone out there who, if there's a certain resource that you would like to see us create or a certain episode that you want to see, we're going to start to create our schedule of Amplify Hangouts for next year. So everyone is always welcome to send us comments, questions, seek advice any and all of the above. So thank you all so, so much for being on tonight. Kim, good luck on Thursday. It's going to be amazing. And uh, I hope that you're able to just relax and soak it in and enjoy it. And um, Kelsey, thank you so much. It was great to see you twice today. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I hope you both have a great night. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Bye. Y'all be well. Yeah. Bye. Awesome. Guys, that has been another episode of the Amplify Horse Racing Hangouts. Don't forget to do your homework. Don't forget to reach out to us, info at amplifyhorseracing.org. And then you can always check out our resources at amplifyhorseracing.org. We're going to have some news up soon about the ne next intake of the mentorship program. So if you're listening to all of this and you're thinking, Oh my Lord, where do I even start? How do I get my foot in the door? Well, we have a mentorship program for that. So keep your eyes and ears peeled. Thank you again. Do your homework and I will see you on the next episode of the Amplify Horse Racing Hangouts. Bye.